Good morning, everyone. It's not good even morning. good. We're not even that far into the morning. Um, my name is Helena Bottomiller Evich. I'm the senior food and agriculture reporter at Politico. Uh, we actually have four food and ag reporters at Politico. A lot of people don't know that. That is my plug. That's my fun fact. I think that's more than any other mainstream media outlet, which we're very proud of. Um, I'm delighted to be here this morning with two members of Congress. We have uh, Dan Newhouse, who is a Republican from Washington State. So we have a Pacific Northwest Republican. And we also have uh, Congressman Shelley Pingree, a Democrat from Maine. So we have a Democrat from the Northeast and a Republican from the Pacific Opposite Northwest. The Pacific. Really and are. I just think that is wonderful. Uh, so I'm so, so uh, happy to be here. Um, a lot of people don't know that both of these members of Congress are <coughs> farmers. There aren't that many farmers in Congress. I was just asking if there's a club. Do you all know each other? How many of them are? You know, so you've been in Congress since 2009. Mm -hmm. Do you know all the other members of Congress who are farmers? I probably know them all, but I actually am not sure which, ex you know, I don't know if I could name. We were kind of guessing there were about 15. I know. In both the House and the Senate, 15. Yeah, I'm pretty sure there's only two organic farmers, and the other one is John Tester in the Senate. So if there's another one, they should reveal themselves. Yeah. Because <laughs> <laughs> I'm tired of being the only one. But uh, So Congressman Newhouse, tell us a little bit about your operation. Uh, I okay. think you grow hops and tree fruit and some other things. Like well, I come from the central part of Washington State, the Yakima Valley, if anybody's familiar with that, <coughs> which is a, a very diverse growing region. We, You know, the state of Washington grows I say everything from A to Z, and, and uh, apples to zucchini, and we can grow almost anything as long as it uh, doesn't mind if it freezes during the winter. It gets a little cold. My operation, uh, we have a, a family farm. Um, my son and his wife are actually running the farm now so that I can come here and, and, and be with Shelly. Um, we have about 650 acres. We raise hops as our main crop, but also wine grapes and juice grapes and cherries and nectarines. We're planting some pears this year. Uh, we've raised a, a lot of different crops over, over, the, over the course of my career. But, uh, uh, and you're, you're going to bring up. Right, we so have, what about the bison? We have a few, I hear there are a bison. few bison animals, yeah. uh, uh, buffalo, blah, a lot of people incorrectly call them, but the American bison. Uh, which is actually a, a very healthy meat and, and a, a hopefully an enterprise that we can turn into a profit center. It isn't right now, but uh, we've, we've only got less, less than a dozen animals that my son is trying to get that enterprise off the ground. So, Yeah, well, I didn't even know we had a bison farmer in Congress, rancher, I guess a bison <laughs> rancher in Congress. So I'm learning something new every day. Well, let me tell you, they're not pets. No, no, no. And I imagine they're not like really friendly? Are they friendly? Well, you know, they're pretty docile if, as long as you don't get in the pen with them and try to do anything <laughs> yes. with them. But uh, in fact, just taking a picture. Here. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So, they, are, uh, they are wild animals. Yes, yes. So uh -huh. Congressman, or Congresswoman Pingree, um, tell us about your farm. Maybe some people in the room are somewhat familiar, but not everyone knows uh, that you've been farming for a long time. Yeah, I actually first got involved in in organic agriculture back in the early 1970s. So I farmed off and on, but the farm I've been on for the last decade um, was actually first settled in 1764 because it's New England um, and uh, was one of the largest farms in our community for many years, but then abandoned for at least 50. So it's 200 acres, but uh, the majority of it is wooded. Um, and we use that wood to our advantage. We um, operate year round. So it's uh, primarily a vegetable farm. And during the winter, like right now, we use um, four hoop houses and three heated greenhouses, which are heated from wood that we, we um, cut on the farm. Um, we raise about 30 pigs every year, and we've had chickens, a couple of dairy cows that we turn their milk into yogurt. Our primary market is that we run a restaurant, a seasonal restaurant from May to October. We have a nine room inn, and then um, once or twice a week in the summer, um, we have 100 people in our barn so we do a farm-to-table dinner that is literally on the farm. You do a tour of the farm, and then you come in and eat wonderful, delicious food that we've created from everything there. So we're very much engaged in kind of eco-tourism, farm tourism, um, and also just this idea of engaging the community in the food that we eat. Our, our winter operation is, is mostly uh, a local CSA, and then we sell to some farms, uh, to some groceries and restaurants. 
Um, and I, our, our farm is on an island off the coast of Maine, so there are 14 year-round islands in Maine. People always think it's some exotic place with no electricity. It's actually not like that. These are active, engaged communities, and if you were there at the turn of the century, there would have been 300 islands with year-round communities. So it's much more of a tradition, and um, it actually was an enormous agricultural territory in the 1800s, mid-1800s, because you could move your produce by steamship, and people used to say if the if the farmer had his produce down at the steamship wharf at 6 o'clock at night, it would be in Boston at 6 in the morning. So it's a whole different way to kind of view New England, which we don't think of as agricultural. But um, excuse me to the Southerners, but Maine fed the Union Army. So we were, yeah. we were the oh. breadbasket of the region. But primarily, we're a vegetable growing operation. We literally have about two acres. It's very intensively farmed in greenhouses. Um, and that is really because of the short season and particularly being on the water. We have really cool springs. So um, we farm in the winter, and then we start everything early, and most of our tomatoes and things are grown inside of a hoop house or a heated greenhouse. So one of the things that uh, Kathleen Merrigan mentioned earlier is that we live in a, just a polarized time politically. I don't think it's any secret that Congress is uh, having trouble passing bills uh, with any amount of frequency. Bipartisanship is sort of tough to come by these days, and yet we have a bipartisan panel. Um, do, I'm curious if, if either of you see agriculture as somewhat of an exception to that polarization. Is it easier to find bipartisanship on these issues, um, or are there certain things that sort of, you know, are 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 just as polarized as they are, you know, as healthcare is, or gun control, or these other issues that we talk about? You know, um, I, I served on the ag committee. <clears throat> excuse me, my first term. And uh, I found it to be a very uh, uh, bipartisan effort. Most bills that come through the Ag Committee go through with a lot of bipartisan support. You know, every single one of us really is a part of the agricultural industry, whether you know it or not. You know, at least three times a day, most people like to mm -hmm. eat. And so they become uh, very interested in, in the policies surrounding agriculture. And I, I think we have a lot of common ground there. You know, Shelley and I are great examples of that. I mm -hmm. think we've been able to work together on several different bills for the benefit uh, of the agricultural industry. And, and you know, certainly the farm bill itself, uh, I've, I've not been through the whole process yet, but from historically what I understand, it, it's not an easy bill to get passed because there's a lot of policy issues in that. But within, within that, there are a lot, of, a lot of things that people agree on uh, and there's a lot of bipartisanship that happens with, within the Farm Bill effort. Um, so, so I would say that uh, we're a great example of how Congress could run and, and should run. Uh, and, <laughs> could and, and should, yeah. right? but it's not quite there. I mean, you've been in Congress for, um, so you've been through what, two Farm Bills now? I'm on my second Farm You're Bill. You're on your yeah. second Farm Bill. Mm -hmm. So do you see it as a place where it's like a rare, a rare area of bipartisanship <clears throat> compared to other policy issues? Yeah, I often use the Agriculture Committee or Agricultural Issues as a good example when people are only seeing Congress from, you know, kind of cable news and can't always understand that, you know, we have good friends on the other no side of the aisle. No one should watch cable news. Yeah, just <laughs> stop. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Just watch C-SPAN. You just see us yeah, every day. It's boring. Yeah. It kind of lulls you to sleep. <laughs> <Yeah>. um, <clears throat> but no, we actually... Um, you know, it's interesting, like, trying to describe agriculture. And I, I should say there are other issues, you know, veterans' issues. There's a lot of things that there's general sure, agreement on. Absolutely. Often yeah. on defense, we come together. You know, there's just places. But <clears throat> ag is a great example. And often our divisions are much more around the region of the country you represent right. or the commodities that you care about. I mean, the fights in, uh, in the Farm Bill, <clears throat> leaving nutrition aside, because that's, that's where all we'll the fighting actually yep. happens. But in the actual body of the agricultural side of the Farm Bill, it tends to be you know corn and cotton and peanuts and everybody trying to get their share, or, or issues over dairy and how dairy works in the Midwest or works in other parts of the country, or uh, crop insurance, you know, uh, uh, which get in very much into the level of where you are in the country. And so you can often, you know, you can be um, fighting against a Democrat if you're a Democrat because they're representing a different commodity and you want your side to get a little more share. So 
Um, <clears throat> I work on a lot of pieces of legislation. I worked on the first farm bill and was able to insert a lot, and we're doing that now. I'm on agriculture appropriations, so the funding every year um, has to move through our committee. And I, I was saying to Dan earlier, I've never had so many Republican co-sponsors of some of the bills I'm doing on organic research or things that affect local food, local farming. Um, we're doing a, a bill on um, that includes uh, food as medicine, and there's a food as medicine working group now with two Republicans and two Democrats kind of chairing it. So <clears throat> I think it's an issue that we, we come together on. I think it's one where in this era of bipartisan, um, of lack of um, healthy bipartisanship, I think one of the reasons more people are kind of joining with each other is to feel like, okay, you know, we do actually like to work together and here's an area where we can. Mm -hmm. um, and I would say one other thing, I, I've been in Congress 10 years and I've been involved in the organic farming movement since the 70s. And I was also a state legislator. But the difference between how people perceive this today, I mean, we know that consumers are very interested in locally grown, sustainably grown, organic food. People want to know what's in their food, and the statistics are huge. Um, but policymakers, who usually lag quite a bit, um, are, are really catching on. And so I, I've really seen a difference in my colleagues from Midwestern states, from places, regions of the country where even 10 years ago, um, people would kind of be like, oh, not that organic stuff, you know? Or 40 years ago when I got started, it was all like hippie Birkenstock. I don't even know why you're doing that stuff. Well, today, that's what the consumers want. So it's more about the markets that farmers can have. You know, if you're going to get a better price in organic dairy, and dairy's a tough topic right now, but, you know, organic tomatoes or all those things, these are all about members of Congress realizing, like, oh, wow, I got this guy in my district growing organic tomatoes, and he's cleaning up, selling to local restaurants. How can I help? So I think there's a real difference in awareness, and a lot of it has to do with um, you know, many farmers coming to the hill all the time and saying, hey, we're, we're not just corn farmers in this region. We're doing all these other things, and, and pay attention. So I want to come back to the Farm Bill, but um, you mentioned appropriations, agriculture appropriations. And I think that's kind of an opportunity to like teach a little bit about Congress, because nobody really knows what appro <laughs> Maybe you guys all do. You're smart. <clears throat> but appropriations is basically the process the government has, the Congress has to keep the government funded, to fund all the departments. Uh, and there's a lot of policy, actually, in these spending bills that Congress works on every year. You're both on the Appropriations Committee. Talk a little bit about that. How is that um, a vehicle for policy? I don't know if research is, I think, something you're working on in appropriations. and is there, is there a pitch to be made for this room to be paying more attention to appropriations bills? I, I almost think of them as like mini farm bills now because they have so much policy in them in terms of um, food and ag. Like the hearings are like, are like three or four hours long. I mean, we have to sit through the whole thing. So. You yeah. have to sit through that. I do. Yeah, you do too, but they get snacks. The members of Congress, they get snacks. They bring, Valadeo brings like root beer flavored milk. There's all sorts of things. I'm, I'm serious. You guys have like a spread and our reporters are sitting back there. Anyway. Yeah. <laughs> but we, yes, we they're long hearings. Them. They're long hearings, yeah. Well, well, I'm sure a lot of people understand the system, uh, the, but there are authorizing committees that uh, uh, or set policy, uh, authorize the, the uh, expenditure of funds for any particular area, but doesn't really have the authority to spend that money. It has to come through, that authority comes through the Appropriations Committee. And so all the power lies there, right, Shelley? Absolutely. It, it, uh, That's why we're there. <laughs> yeah. Um, and you're on the Ag Appropriations mm -hmm. Subcommittee, a place that I aspire to be at some point. And that gives you an indication of the popularity of agriculture. Uh, being a farmer, that's where I think I should be. You didn't get an automatic ticket. You to would the think, right? Uh, <laughs> yeah. But there, no one wanted to move off that subcommittee. I'm a, I'm a fairly new member of the mm -hmm. Appropriations Committee, been on just a year and uh, waiting for a vacancy right. to, to... And Congressman Newhouse, you were elected in 2000... Or you've been in Congress since, what, 2000... This is my second 15? term, so okay. 2014, 2014 is when I was elected. Okay. Yeah. So... Yeah. But, um, so you're right. The, the Appropriations Committee is a, is a key spot. Nothing happens without money, really. And, and so we decide uh, uh, how much money is appropriated to each individual uh, area. Uh, and that's where... I'll, you know, I'm not sure if there's a written rule. Um, authorizing is <laughs> not supposed to happen in appropriations until it does. You would never until, until it does. That's yeah. what they and say. So, yeah. 
that can be used as an argument why you can't do something if it's convenient and people don't want it to happen. But if, you, if people want something to happen, then yeah, the authorizing exactly. can go forward. So it's an interesting dynamic that you have to learn how to navigate. And you can sort of direct uh, research funding or, or initiatives or um, give some examples of what the, the kinds of things that you can do. Well, a couple things that are important about the committee. Um, one, because this budget cycle happens every single year. So um, whereas the Farm Bill is theoretically reauthorized every five theoretically. years. Theoretically. And, yeah. Yeah, and then a lot of work goes into that. But this is every year. So um, you know how you fund things is policy. So which departments get more? Which ones get cut? What gets zeroed out? You know, we get a, a, this is the second year we've gotten a budget from this White House, and there are big zeros in a lot of programs that people yeah. care about around conservation or things that would affect you know small to medium sized farmers. Um, and so you know part of what we do, and we have to do it in a bipartisan way, is figure out which of those programs are really important and make sure there's no zero that it actually gets the funding. So I mean that's critically important. It happens every year. And then this question around um, kind of authorizing, we often you know know that we're not going to get a bill to move through the floor, but then we'll think about. Um, what could we write for language that goes into a farm bill, I mean, to, into an appropriations bill? And that language can be, you know, directing a department to do something, getting more of a study, you know, changing the language around something. And so it's a very valuable tool, particularly in somewhat of a gridlock Congress, um, where maybe a farm bill isn't moving as fast as you want and all those other things. The other thing I would say is that. Um, you have a fair degree of oversight of all the departments. Um, so virtually you know, any department that's at the USDA, the FDA, the, the departments where we have oversight, um, will come in front of our subcommittee and make a presentation. And so you get a chance to ask them all kinds of questions. Um, not that we couldn't anyway and bring them into a, you know, a meeting in our office, but this is just all of us together asking these questions about you know, how something is being conducted at the department, why these Literally, I mean, I hear from farmers like, why aren't the forms for the applications for a certain grant going out fast enough? Or, you know, how did they do the review process? So anyway, it's, it's a lot of ways to get your fingers in the middle of things, particularly if it's an issue that you, you care deeply about. Um, and again, it tends to be a very bipartisan effort. Mm -hmm. um, and you kind of get all the time you want to ask all the questions you mm -hmm. want or to, you know, encourage the chair to bring someone before you. So. So the takeaway here is that you should all take times out of your schedule to watch the appropriations committee hearings and markups because you can actually get a lot of policy um, knowledge and sort of like a, a sense of where things are and what's moving. I, I want to make yeah. an important point about the snacks. So <laughs> yeah. the snacks are like, that is when the, so you have subcommittee meetings, but then we all meet together in a room, every, every appropriator um, from all subcommittees um, to do a markup, which is the last stage of a particular bill. Um, and there are all these snacks that come in, you know, Valdeo wants to support, wants us all to support California dairy, so yeah. it brings every flavor Flavored. of dairy. Flavored. Really? But we've been having a little bit of an argument about who has better blueberries, which for anyone who knows Maine, we, we are the largest I, wild blueberry producer in the world. And I didn't these, know there was a question here. No, yeah, no, exactly. no, no. So some of these other states, which think that they have great blueberries, and the Whoa. chair actually is from New Jersey, and he thought he had the best blueberries. <laughs> so just to settle the argument, Recently, I brought in uh, blueberry pies made in Maine for everyone. And I think pretty much everyone came around that a wild blueberry is better <laughs> than a cultivated. They all both have their place, but uh -huh. wild blueberries. So, so that was so, an important point to be so made. So asking for equal time here. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> Yes. Being, being the number one blueberry producer in the country, the state of Washington also has some things right. to say all about right, that. All right. but, uh, but, but, but you're right. You, were, you made the effort to bring a product in from your state. I'll, ha I'll have to reciprocate. <laughs> so where's the pie? Yeah. Where's the pie? Right, right. Well, I am actually from Washington State. So if there was a tiebreaker, I hate to say that I would definitely be <laughs> oh, so on Team New House. Yeah. Um, so I want to go back to the, the farm bill, which maybe they should bring more snacks to the <laughs> Ag Committee. Maybe this would be further along. but. Um, uh, we're expecting the House Agriculture Committee to release uh, its version of the Farm Bill sometime in the sure. coming weeks. We're not sure exactly when. Um, I'm wondering if either of you, you're not, neither of you are on the Ag Committee right now, but um, do you think that there is a strong chance that that will be a bipartisan effort sort of to the end? And are you, I guess, are you worried at all that some of the conversation, particularly about around nutrition, I know um, Congresswoman Pinker, you've been following this really closely, um, 
has, you know, does that sort of threaten uh, the bipartisan nature of the farm bill? Um, I don't know if you all followed the um, conversation about around harvest boxes that was in President Trump's budget, mm. uh, but there was a proposal to convert half of SNAP benefits for um, some 16.4 million households uh, into a harvest box. That was their name for it. It's um, basically a shelf-stable box of sta has staples in it, so shelf-stable milk, canned meats, peanut butter, pastas, juices, tomato canned tomatoes, things like that. Um, that got a ton of attention. Like it actually broke through. Snap was <coughs> trending on Facebook for a couple of hours, which Thanks. is very unusual. Um, are these types of things that we get sort of whipped up about threatening it all to, the, to this bipartisan sort of ag, um, you know, it's almost like a, I don't want to call it a safe space, but it's like this, this place where people are coming together more. Um, <clears throat> well, uh, so, so far the, the chair is still saying that the, um, that the farm bill will see the light of day, will have a markup, and will be enacted by the end of this quarter. So mm -hmm. that means by the end of March. So for all of you who follow Congress, um, I don't know how many legislative days we have in March. We actually have already been excused this week because of um, Billy Graham being in the Capitol, his body being there and lying in honor. So we're not even in this week anymore. Um, then you know weeks get short, and we've got you know DACA decision coming up, and we've mm -hmm. got uh, you know maybe some firearms debate that happens, and then we have another budget deadline. The continuing resolution gets done, and then I think March 23rd. So we have a, a, actually a lot of things that are kind of swirling around, and so to take up a farm bill, um, which would need a markup next week, and that would have to come to the floor, and the chair is saying there will be an open amendment of process, which doesn't happen on everything, but hopefully will. So that means that you can offer amendments and right. it's a longer, more open process. And there are so many longer. things that yeah. will or won't be in there that people right. want to argue about, um, you know, that we'll all be submitting eight, hundreds. ten, hundreds of amendments. Yeah. So that takes a really, really long time. So it's hard logistically to even imagine that. And then the second issue is um, this farm bill, unlike the last one that I worked on, um, has been mostly negotiated sort of within the chairs and ranking members or behind the scenes, and um, nobody knows too much about it. Um, Colin Peterson, who's the ranking member on the Ag Committee in the House, has been engaged in a lot of those conversations, but even he hasn't seen the nutrition <coughs> title. Mm -hmm. And the reason that's important is because really literally over 80% of the farm bill, the authorization of the, the authorization of the funds, is for nutrition programs and primarily SNAP. And so while we might have all kinds of agreement on a whole variety of programs that we all care about and that could impact the farmers in your region or, or everything else, nutrition is where we really kind of get in disagreement. And it tends to be about SNAP. It tends to be about um, how much will be in the benefits, whether there'll be added requirements mm -hmm. to SNAP recipients, um, like work requirements, drug testing. And these things get very volatile and controversial. And then the harvest boxes, which is the newest suggestion, which has been problematic in my mind because part of the work that I've done is to really encourage things like the double bucks program so people can get more healthy fruits and vegetables. So you can use the limited dollars you have on SNAP to actually get healthier foods at the store. So the idea if a lot of it was taken up by perishables, I mean non-perishables, which people may not even be familiar with or want to cook and not get that choice. Um, the other critically important part is um, Generally in the House, because the Farm Bill is a big spending bill, and some of the most conservative Republican members in the House don't go along with it, you really need bipartisan support. There's, there's been a um, you know, general uh, need for the Republicans to get the Democrats to vote in some number, like 30 or 40 or something else. And um, that doesn't happen on every piece of legislation in the House, because a lot of times the, the Republicans are in the majority, they have plenty to pass a a tax bill or anything else. So without the Democrats having seen the nutrition title and with big concerns being raised by Representative McGovern, who leads the Hunger Caucus and is on the Agriculture Committee about harvest boxes and about some of the likely SNAP proposals, it's very hard to imagine how, without even starting the negotiations around that, how that all comes together. Because again, it can't, it, this cannot be, this is not a bill that can be passed with only the Republicans. So since we haven't seen it, and since we're likely to disagree on SNAP, which is where we usually come to blows. It's a lot to do in the next month. Yeah, that sounds like a lot to do. And then you have two weeks off, right? So, I mean, Yeah, then Congress really is, is a recess for even, two weeks, right. yeah. Then we won't come back till sometime right. in April. 
So, so just a little yeah. bit about, um, yeah. um, first of all, and I know people know this, but the administration, the president's budget is, uh, has no force of law. It's a, it's a, a, a list of priorities, I guess. Of, it's a maybe, suggestion to Congress. It's a suggestion. Yeah. Congress has the ability to, to pass laws, and so that's, that's where you know, people sometimes get very anxious about some things that maybe are being proposed that probably have a little chance of, of actually becoming reality. <clears throat> but it, it adds to the, to the discussion and, and can be helpful for, you know, depending on uh, what the issue is. I do know, um, after serving my first term in agriculture, that Chairman Conaway and, and uh, Ranking Member Peterson have been very engaged in this whole SNAP issue. I think there's been lot of hearings. 22 or some, some almost two dozen hearings mm -hmm. about the nutrition program. So they've really been uh, delving into this as deeply as they can, uh, uh, trying to look at how to make sure that, you know, the people that need uh, this uh, nutrition assistance get it, that we're, we're being as efficient as, and, uh, as we can be with the taxpayer dollars and, and, and just make sure that the system is working as well as it, it, as it should be and that it's, a, and it's actually a, uh, a springboard for people to, to improve their lives, to get them into uh, a, a better place in life so they don't depend on, on the government for, 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 for nutrition programs, which I think is what everybody's goal would be. And so, but, but this is a flashpoint. It's a, it's a place where there, there's a, it's a, a lot of opportunities for um, debate and, and, and disagreement. Um, but with all that happening in the background up to this point, I'm, I'm hopeful that uh, whether we get it done this quarter or not, I agree that seems ambitious since we've not seen all the language yet <laughs> and it's already almost March. Um, but I'm hopeful that we at least will get the Farm Bill done before this current one expires. Mm -hmm. Which is uh, at the end of September. So that's mm -hmm. like a big question is can Congress sort of get it together? Also on the Senate side, they need to, they're not as far along. They need to come up with their own farm bill. Um, and it's kind of a, I don't want to say it's a similar situation, but in the Senate, the bet is you have to have a bipartisan. I mean, it's, sure. it's almost mm -hmm. uh, impossible to imagine uh, getting a farm bill through with just Republicans. And they're nowhere near as far down the road in mm -hmm. hearings or yeah. gathering. Yeah, I so don't think they're... It's hard to imagine how right. they get close soon. Right. Um, so I want to switch gears a little bit here. Um, very much in the theme of today, um, the farm, you know, farmers are aging. I think the vast majority of our, uh, our farmers are over the age of 55, 60. They're sort of approaching retirement age. Um, and it's something we talk about a lot, right? How, look, what are the policies that can help uh, young and beginning farmers get, get involved? Um, are you seeing any movement on uh, Capitol Hill around these issues? Like, I think that you have a bill, right? Can mm -hmm. you tell us a little bit about that? Are there, are there enough, uh, is there enough bipartisan kind of cooperation on that to get to move that forward? Is that something you could incorporate in the farm bill? Absolutely, but uh, you know, it, it, it's a really good question, and I think um, you know, Secretary Purdue is well aware of this. Secretary Vilsack talked about all the time about how many farmers we were going to be short and how they're aging out, and it's just a reality of the current situation. And um, I'm, I'm very proud of Maine, where we've seen a lot of growth in agriculture, unlike other places, and we have a, a, a much higher percentage of young farmers. I think it's like 30 percent greater than the national average. Wow, so why do you think that is? Why is it different? And, and I want to say we have double yeah. the number of women going into agriculture yeah. um, right now. And I think a lot of it is because um, we've, uh, we've captured some of the opportunities that people can have around small to medium sized farms, value added farms. Um, we're a state that was a big agricultural state, as I said, mm -hmm. that kind of um, you know, we, we, we lost out in poultry and dairy and a lot of things when grain, you know, had to come from the Midwest and people had a, an advantage. So there's actually been a lot more available farmland at a much more reasonable price than you could get into it in the Midwest or some of the higher value regions. So I think it was an opportunity. And we've had um, a little bit of an infrastructure, an organic um, farming association that's been there for 40 years and a farmland trust organization. So a lot of the infrastructure and support that you know you can ask a farmer down the road or you can join a group of other young farmers and there's apprenticeship programs and journeyman programs. And I think those things are really important, but the federal programs are really critical and some of them 
um, that are being proposed. Um, you know, the beginning and rancher section of the farm bill is really critical in helping access capital or technical assistance. There's a proposal out there um, to do some loan forgiveness because that's one of the big issues that young farmers have. They go to college yeah. and then they decide to be on the farm and everybody knows you're not going to make a, yeah. an income. Um, and you know, one of the things I was just at an agricultural conference um, this past weekend, one of the things you hear about the most is concern about the Affordable Care Act. And mm -hmm. you know, that has made it possible for a lot of farming families, which is a dangerous business, to survive. And young, young people aren't gonna get into farming if suddenly they look back into that black hole and say, wait a minute, where am I gonna get insurance? And we're planning to have a family and I'm in a dangerous job. We hear so. this a lot. Actually, healthcare, I think, is one of the more undercovered pieces of, of ag. I hear a lot about the lack of choice in rural plans and the high, I mean, the premiums are skyrocketing. It's like a, a huge problem. So we don't have a ton of time, but Congress in the Newhouse, uh, is the situation any better in Washington state uh, as far as getting those beginning <laughs> farmers a foot in the door? Well, I would, I, I would say that um, a lot of these programs are helping uh, tremendously. And just for an example, <clears throat> it's no secret that much of the farm labor that uh, that we see in, in the Pacific Northwest is comes from south of the border. A lot of uh, uh, Hispanic, uh, potent, uh, primarily Mexican uh, people coming up to work in our farms, which are great. They're great workers, and I speak Spanish because of that, and I, I love and that. A lot of it's high skilled, actually. People oh, absolutely. don't realize yeah. this. Yeah. People say unskilled labor. That yeah. is not true. Yeah. Uh, a very important part of our, the whole economic uh, uh, situation we have. But what we're seeing. I could tell you probably of a, a half a dozen little farms, uh, probably within a five mile radius of my house, that are being started by people that used to be uh, farm laborers, yeah. or maybe still do work on someone else's farm, but are starting their own farm. And, and that, that's really an exciting thing to see. Plus, a lot of our larger farms are now being managed, and some are being owned by some of these mi minority uh, used to be farm laborers, which is, wow. I think, a great uh, testament to some of the things mm -hmm. that are, are, are being made possible because of some of these things. But, uh, but one other point I wanted to make about that real quickly, uh, you know, agriculture is a tough business. You're subject to mother nature, to a lot of things that are out of your control, you know, markets and prices and costs and all those things. Um, I, I think the, the, the probably the most beneficial thing that we can do as a government is uh, to take some of that uncertainty away as much as we possibly can. Make sure that we have policies in place to, to ensure that there are markets available, not just domestic but international markets. You know, have, we have trade agreements, that we have the tools people need in, in order to be successful farmers, that there's labor available, that there's water available, that the tax system that we have is conducive to to a, a, a successful business operation, all the healthcare situation, all those things, whether you're a young farmer or a not so young mm -hmm. farmer, uh, you need those things because it, it is a, a tough business. Uh, you put everything on the line every single year and you need to have mm -hmm. a, 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 an economic climate conducive to successful businesses. Right, so it sounds like Congress has a lot of work to do to create that certainty on so many of these issues. So anyway, it sounds like you guys have a lot on your plate. Thank you so much for joining sure. us this morning. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you all. Appreciate Thanks. it.